follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. I read this, and I laugh. Because if Jesus knocked on my door or walked through that door and said, come and follow me, I'd go, hold, 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 hold on, wait, I got bills to pay. <clears throat> they left their nets and there they went. Hi, Jesus, I'm here. I'm ready. They're like kids today. The minute I said, and Jesus said, follow me, and I started moving, they were right along with me. None of you got up from your pews, I noticed. <laughs> Isn't that the reality, though? We get comfortable in our seat. I don't know about you all. I don't like to ride in the car with someone I've never ridden in a car with. Maybe that's because I love my husband dearly, but he is a terrifying driver. Do not ever ride with him. <laughs> and it is in my psych, my brain, my psychological lack of whatever, the minute I hop into a car with somebody else, I almost want to like find, you know, the, the death grip uh, handle. You all know that handle that's in your car on the passenger side. There's a wonderful, famous country song, Jesus Take the Wheel. But I'm holding on to that handle, right? That's essentially what this is all about. Follow me. Don't think. Don't worry. Just follow. We don't do that well. Because we allow the burdens of life to hold us back. We say, can't you give me a minute to get all of my stuff in order? Or let me at least take a suitcase. I mean, I don't need to change your clothes. Or we get caught up in the logistics of it. Well, I can't follow Jesus on any day but Sunday. Because the rest of my week is jam-packed with things that I need to do. Need. Well, I find that need to do the rest of our week is at strict conflict with what we are commanded by Christ and by God to do, is it not? We're asked to do so little, and yet the commitment is much. And I think we all understand that the commitment is much, and perhaps it's the reason we're not willing to give it 100%. And we talk to ourselves into the fact that 90%, maybe 50%, maybe even 25%, or wait, hold on, only 10%, because that's a tithe, is okay. Peter and Andrew left their entire livelihoods behind. And as I said, it's a pretty story. It reads very beautifully. We don't know what if any other discussion went on. The gospel writers are compact writers. They had to get a lot into a very small space. It's kind of like sending a 160-character tweet. You can only say so much. For those of you that do not know tweeting on Twitter, you only have... 160 characters. <clears throat> and of course, the gospel writers wrote the gospels over a generation after the time of Christ. 
So they have a little bit of time to sit there and make it sound pretty and wonderful. But we know here today that the reality of following Jesus is not as simple as dropping your net or dropping your responsibilities and dropping everything and going out the door and saying, Here I am, Lord, use me. Or is it? Because inside our walls, we get comfortable. We have lovely cushions on our pews. Thank you, Jesus. Otherwise, you would not be so amenable to sitting here and listening to your minister preach for 20-something minutes. I do not know how they did it in the good old days before. I'm grateful for the time that we live in. I mean, it's an amazing time. I consider the age of my grandparents where my grandma used to literally do her laundry until she finally got like a legitimate washer and dryer. She did it by like one of those turn cranky things that you see in like on cute old pictures of the Sears and Roebuck catalog. I remember that vaguely. I remember the kitchen table covered in canning jars and the big garden in the back. I remember distinctly my fear of the chickens because I knew what happened to them. But that's another age and era that we are, that's considered the bygone days. Very few people still live in that reality here and now. I mean, hello. I could go to my computer and call in my grocery list and go through a drive through and it's put in my car for five extra dollars. Who doesn't love that? It's a time saver. So that I can do all of the other things that I need to do. But when Christ said, follow me, they gave their all. They dropped everything. They made Christ a priority. And I feel that as people of God here and today, we have all of these wonderful time-saving inventions. We have cars that take us back and forth in an instant where it used to, would have taken much longer to walk or do other, other modes of crazy transportation. I mean, horses, hello. Mm. And yet, where's the time go? We have wonderful means of saving time, and yet, with the time that we've been given, we bemoan the fact that we do not have enough time to read our scriptures or do more for God or do more for the church or whatsoever because the time that we save, we then devote to something else. So it's not about the time. It's about the priority. It's about dropping everything and following Jesus first. And I'm not saying that as a point of condemnation. I'm saying that as a point of reality that we are all to be held in sin in that way. Yeah, because it's a sin. Prioritizing God alone. God said the very first commandment is, okay, maybe we need to refresh a course like worship and wonder. I promise they're learning it. No other gods before me. And you shall keep my Sabbath day holy. Yet how many of us, and I admit, I am the same. This, I say this not just for us, but for all of us. A lot of times I preach a sermon and it's not for you, it's for me. You hear a reminder of the fact that the first person we should focus on, the first person we should be following is Christ, is God. It is all throughout these lovely books in and our pews. That's a simple command. Follow me. We learn it as children, as Simon says. I mean, hello. Who didn't love being the last one who had done everything correct and got to be the next Simon? challenge for 
us as the people, here in the church, here and now? How do we follow? How do we prioritize God in our lives? And for each of us, that is a different thing. You know, Jesus came, he came and he saw and he walked by the sea and he saw them and he said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. That worked for the brothers that were fishermen. But we only hear about the four brothers. But as Jesus continues to get followers and as he continues to gather these people to him, what did they leave behind? And does it matter? We talk so often of our responsibilities to this life that we are living and leading. We psyched ourselves out, allowed our brains to be washed by an unfounded reality of what is important. We let God take second place, or third place, or fourth, or fifth, or I might squeeze it in if I have time. The spiritual discipline. We'll be talking over the season of Lent about habits of holiness because I feel it is a habit. Because people feel like the word spiritual discipline is a punishment. Right? You hear that word discipline. You've done something wrong. When it comes to God, no, you've done something right. You're following. Because the other part of this scripture is not just, I will follow. It's the second step. You see, you have to commit to following to do the second step. Christ says, follow me. And that second step is, I will make you fishers of, or people. You know, we are in a slightly different colloquial understanding of, of, of world right now. And I'm sure if that was the language of the time, Christ would have used the language of this time. So Christ gives us the command, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. You remember what he said about the nets, when he tossed the nets out and they were so full that they could barely contain the bounty in the boats. As a church, we have our resolutions for this year, good, bad, or indifferent. And you made them. We made them together. They're on the front of our bulletins. None of these will come to fruition if we do not follow first. Can't put the cart before the horse. Yeah, I'm sure none of you even noticed it was on the front of the bulletin, did you? I love that. Things become so familiar that we forget. It's up to us as the people of God to be just like these children. And the minute God says, follow me, we go. It might not be comfortable. We might not necessarily know what direction we are headed. And I think that for many of us who live with a GPS just to get from one side of town to the other, that can be frightening. But 
But if we, as a people of God, as we, if we who proclaim ourselves to be Christians put our trust in Christ, then following should not be an issue. And once we get ourselves together on the same track, the following track, the here we go, God, here we go, please just take me along for the ride, I'm here. I will follow. Then the rest will come. Because if you put your trust in God for a little, you can put your trust in God for much. Christ says those words, follow me, and our response is yes. Amen. <laughs> follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. I read this, and I laugh. Because if Jesus knocked on my door or walked through that door and said, come and follow me, I'd go, hold, 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 hold on, wait, I got bills to pay. 